I would have loved to have walked on to Jeannie in a bottle. That would have been great. <laughs> so design systems aren't a new thing, but they're really popular right now. We've heard references to design systems a couple of times at this conference already. And we've seen a big increase in the amount of conversation around design systems in the past couple of years. More and more teams are adopting design systems and writing about them. And you probably heard about the benefits of creating a design system. We've heard some of them at this conference already. You have faster builds through reusable components and shared rationale, better products because you're building more cohesive user experiences, improved maintenance and scalability by reducing design and technical debt, and stronger focus for product teams. You know, the system can tackle the more repetitive problems so that product teams can focus on the more complicated problems. So I've been working on design systems for the past couple of years. While I was at Vox Media, I worked on the design system for over 350 websites that were on their platform. And now I work at Shopify, where I lead the Polaris design system team. And so I lead a team of about 18 people that are designers, content strategists, researchers, developers, all creating a design system that helps people at Shopify help uh, the product teams make commerce better for everyone. So I really love design systems, and I believe in all of their benefits. But I've also heard a couple of common themes or complaints from people that are using design systems to build products. Maybe you've heard some of these as well. So there's been a couple of times when I've onboarded new designers onto the team. And I'm like, welcome to the team. Here's this fantastic design system. It has all of the font styles and button styles defined for you. So you can solve the real problems, right? The, the complicated problems. And they're, they're like, that's great. And then a couple of weeks later, they're like, can I change the font? Or, can I design a new button style? And I'm like, no, you don't have to do that. We have a design system. And you know, <laughs> they'll come back with a design that uses a completely different font. When I hear this, uh, this to me speaks to a designer wanting to be creative with the system and wanting to understand how they can be creative with the design system. Maybe that's not clear uh, on first glance. Another scenario that I've come across are teams that are where you have designers on product teams that want to customize a component, but they'll do it secretly. Like they'll, they're like, I want to make this customization, but I don't want the design system team to find out about it. So I'm just going to fork this component. No one will ever know. And to me, these designers, what they're really after is the sense of shared ownership in the design system. They want to feel empowered to be able to change it, but maybe they feel like they can't, so they're hiding. And then here's my least favorite, which I've heard in a couple of design reviews. This is the best I could do, given the constraints of the system. That one is really painful for me, because I don't want designers to feel constrained or limited by the system. And so when I hear this, what I hear is that these designers need more flexibility. They want to be able to experiment and not feel constrained. And this is really important to me, too, because I want designers to create the best solutions, period, not be hindered by a system. So despite all of the benefits of design systems, there's still some frustrations. Rigid systems that stifle creativity, monotonous systems that lead to generic cookie-cutter designs, overly specific systems that can't be adapted to enough use cases, and complicated systems that lead to fragmented user experiences and can't scale. So I've seen how design systems can constrain, but I've also seen how design systems can allow brands to feel unified, cohesive, and harmonious while also leaving room for experimentation. 
That's what I call an expressive design system. So what, what is an expressive design system? They have three defining qualities. They're purpose, they're purpose built. So your design system should explain how your brand should look, feel, and sound, and it should be distinct to your brand. They support a range of use. So your design system should enable meaningful experimentation and divergence while still retaining the spirit of the system at large. And they should inspire use. Designers should feel motivated to solve those complex problems with the design system rather than feeling constrained by it. So let's take a look at one of my favorite examples of an expressive system. And it's fitting that we're in a railway museum right now uh, because it's about the London Underground. So several years ago, Transport for London faced a problem. Over the years, the quality of design across their stations had grown inconsistent. And what the team realized was that having consistent design in their stations had a lot of power. In their research, they even found that a traveler could perceive their travel time was shorter if the station was well-maintained and cared for. So to solve this problem, they created a London Underground Station design idiom which is a design philosophy and practical guide to maintaining existing stations and creating new ones. And it contains principles and guidelines that can be applied to every station and every project, from a small repair to a major refurbishment, all the way up to building a brand new station. But here's a challenge with that. These are two different stations, just two uh, stations that are part of the London Underground Network. You can see they're pretty different. So the one on the left is the Maida Vale station. It was built in 1915. It's um, a metro station, which are often these focal points or interchange hubs within a city. It's well known for its glazed terracotta exteriors and mosaics. And then on the right is the Stratford station. And this part here was built in the mid-1990s. And you can see that it uses different materials. This one uses glass. And this station serves as a destination point rather than an interchange point. So how could both of these stations use the same design system? The design idiom solves for this by first specifying the qualities that should be shared across all stations and also where there's room for deviation. At its core are nine experience principles that should be applied across the board, like consider wholeness and uh, use uh, lighting for ambiance. What they're saying here is it doesn't matter what the stations look like, they should all feel like they have a cohesive experience. The other thing that they did was kind of map what a user's journey should feel like at all of these stations, because their ultimate goal is to help travelers get from one point to another in the clearest way possible. So what they specify is every, every journey has these different touch points, like customer information areas, ticketing, and meeting points. And people working on these stations should be using circular points to help people find their way. But I think one of the most interesting parts of the design idiom are actually these station flashcards. So in addition to those initial kind of shared principles, they designed 20 flashcards for, for 20 different time periods and types of stations. So this is a flashcard from a Victorian time period. And it uses green and timber and kind of, uh, I think, gabled roofs. That's what those are called. <laughs> And then here's from the 1920s, where there's this ribbon blue color and a pan teal roof, very different from the Victorian styles. And then here's a flashcard from 2015, which uses a completely different color palette, a more corporate blue and more like glass and glazed ceramic materials. The flashcards honor what's unique about each of the stations. But each station also needs to feel like it's part of the overall London underground network, 
because travelers could see multiple types of stations across their journey. So by defining wayfinding, customer information areas, ticketing and meeting points in consistent ways, the makers of this idiom help people not get lost. Ultimately, what they did was find the right balance between network consistency and local flexibility. And this is a really hard balance to strike when you're working at scale. You could lean too far towards consistency and have rigid systems that don't fully solve user needs, or you could lean too hard towards flexibility and lose your overall sense of identity. So let's go back to that definition of an expressive system. The London design idiom has the purpose to help commuters find their way clearly and easily. It has a range of expression with the station flashcards. And I'm not part of the team, so I don't know if it is inspirational to work with, but they've done some things like create guidelines instead of rules, which I think would be uh, allow for some creativity. The way that this works is because they have that shared foundation as well as room for variation. And I think having that scaffolding is really key for building an expressive system. So the shared foundation are the experience principles, the station flashcards are the room for variation, and together it allows them to create stations that fit within their time periods, materials, and neighborhoods. Now, here's what these things get us. The purpose of having a shared foundation in a design system is that it enables harmony. That means that all of the elements of the design system are working together, they have a cohesive voice. The room for variation enables flexibility. It allows you to use the system to solve contextual problems in a better way, instead of constraining people. And together, these things enable improvisation. So they allow teams to be able to use the pieces in creative ways. So I'm going to talk about how we create expressive design systems by enabling harmony, enabling flexibility, and enabling improvisation. So first up is harmony. There's a few reasons why I think harmony is really important for a design system. The whole act of having a design system and building a design system is that we are breaking down our user interfaces into these small pieces. But users don't, don't look at the small pieces. They're not experiencing our products as these little individual parts. They're seeing a full page. They're seeing a full experience, a full workflow. And so we have to make sure that when these pieces are put together, that they fit in a harmonious way. The other challenge is you might have one team creating the system and other teams using the system to create experiences. And it is impossible for a team that's creating a design system to anticipate all of the different ways that people are going to use it. So we don't always know how the pieces of a system are going to be put together, but we want them to fit when they are put together. One thing that I've seen prevent harmony in a design system is we tend to treat the brand elements and the components as separate concerns. So we'll talk about our components and the structure of our components and the functionality, and we'll build them out. And then we'll define our typography or our color system. But we're essentially talking about them like a skin, like the design language is a visual skin on top of the components rather than being something that's much more integrated. I compare it to if you are, you know, you have a table and you're putting a coat of paint on that table. The paint isn't the only thing that defines what that table looks like. The structure of it, the types of materials that, it, that, that use it, the types of legs that it has, all of those things come together to define how that table behaves. And so we have to think about our components and our brand elements in the same way. So we won't be able to predict all of the different combinations of components that will make up our pages. But what we can do 
is think about our brand language as it applies to a component hierarchy. So when we're thoughtful about how our brand is expressed at every level of our component hierarchy, then we can enable some harmonious designs. So the lowest layer in that hierarchy are the basic components, sometimes called elements or basics or atoms. They're these components that can't be broken down any further. They're the building blocks of a system because their, their purpose is to be reused really frequently. At this level, um, you know, we're primarily looking for design, like type and color, to be more functional. So color is used to direct attention. Type should be readable at a small scale. But there's still ways to achieve some kind of distinct look and feels, even at this basic component level. So if you compare this button from Bon Appetit on the left with this group of buttons from The Guardian on the right, they're communicating something different. So the, Guardi the Bon Appetit's button has more generous spacing around it. The type isn't set in all caps in a lighter font. It's tracked out. It kind of has a more breezy feel to it. While the color yellow, the tighter spacing, the arrow, and the Guardian's buttons, they communicate more urgency. So if we take that and we go up a level, to the composite components. So composite components are collections of basic components that have been arranged in specific and opinionated ways. These components are also reusable, but they typically serve a more specific purpose. And again, we can see those same decisions that Bon Appetit made in the button and the Guardian made in the button carry over to these story card components. What I think is really interesting about this example is that structurally, these two components are very, very similar. They have an image. They have a title. Their purpose is to have a preview of an article. But the way they look is, is pretty different, and what they convey is pretty different. So on the left, Bon Appetit has that large photo. They have centered type and much more spacing around the typography. Overall, it, the design feels a little bit more relaxed, like I can just kind of browse it on a you know, casual day. The Guardian has the same elements, but everything is much tighter together. There's very little spacing around the, the headline and the photograph. And so they communicate a sense of urgency rather than Bon Appetit, which feels a little bit more relaxed. So then we get to the next level, which are containers or regions. And so these are the larger areas of a page that contain the composite components. Once we get to this level, we can start to see how the pieces are working together. So you could have color can be used as a background to signal a shift in content or tone. Here we start to do more interesting things with space, so the space within uh, containers and around the containers can really kind of, um, you can use density in an interesting way. Then once you get to the page level, you see how all of the pieces fit together. So here, the simplicity of the image, the ample white space, the lightweight navigation, all feel harmonious. The experience feels breezy, like you can sit back and take it in. And here, the denser spacing overall, the heavier typography, the gridded layout, they communicate a higher sense of urgency. But both of these feel harmonious because they fit the tone of uh, the brand. So imagine if the Guardian had the amount of spacing that Bon Appetit has around its components. It would feel disjointed. So we need to not only think about design elements at each level, but also how they fit together. So, and to do this, we need to explore our design language both globally and granularly. And just like there's a hierarchy to components, there's also a hierarchy to the types of design decisions that you make. I like to think about it in terms of big levers and small dials. So levers are broad, sweeping decisions about how an experience should feel. And dials are small, detailed choices that enable those feelings. 
Uh, the way that I, the, why, the reason I describe it that way is it's like you're pulling a lever versus turning a little dial. A lot of the times when I'm making design decisions and I'm defining something like typography, I might be switching between 16 pixels or 14 pixels or 18 pixels until I get it quite right, just kind of like turning a little dial, versus if I'm making a big decision about how my design should feel, does it feel loose or does it feel airy or does it feel dense? It's kind of like pulling a, a large lever. So, like I said, the levers are these broad, sweeping decisions. And imagine if you have a design in front of you. If you were to make the entire design feel heavier and more dense, what would you change? You would probably reduce the amount of space between elements. You might swap out fonts for a bolder weight or add a dark background. Now, what if you wanted to make that same design feel light and airy, that you would increase space? You would use lighter typography. You would use lighter colors. So you're not actually pulling any levers or turning any dials. But I use the metaphor because it helps me and my team get in the mindset that all of these design decisions are interconnected, and we have to think about them together in order to really have a harmonious design. So there's a couple of levers that I, that I tend to focus on. One of them is size, and that is what size are the elements on the page? Should they generally be large or small? And this choice ties back to the purpose of your product and what your user expects to be able to do. Do you want someone to take their time consuming all of your content and focusing on one thing at a time? Then you would probably choose larger elements that take up more room. Or if you want someone to really quickly see every action they can take at a glance, then you would choose smaller elements. Oops. The next one is scale, which is what size are the elements relative to each other. So should there be more dramatic size contrast between elements, or should everything feel kind of evenly sized? Scale is used to focus attention. So if you want to guide your users through a process, then you would probably put one more pronounced call to action. But if you want your user to choose their own path, then you would use less contrast to highlight that there's more paths to choose from. Then there's density, which is overall, how dense is the page? Should it feel airy or compact? Um, a page with lots of space between elements is going to feel more airy than a page with really tightly packed elements. And then there's weight. Density and weight are related, but they're not identical. So density refers to how tightly packed your elements are, while weight refers to the overall heaviness of a page. So a page with dark headers and bold, compact fonts is going to feel heavier than a page with delicate fonts and light colors. So just to demonstrate what that looks like in action, um, a good example is Airtable. So on their marketing homepage, Airtable want to convince a potential user to sign up. So they're really, really pointing you to that field where you enter your email address and push the Get Started button. So there's a lot of space around that call to action. Generally, the page is more kind of open and airy. And there's a higher size contrast between the elements. But once you've signed up and are using the product, then it becomes a lot more functional. So the product itself, the elements are smaller. There's less size contrast. It's denser overall. And unlike the previous page, where there's really that one call to action that they want you to focus on, here there's many paths that you can take. And you get that because of the lower size contrast. So their levers might look something like this. So on their marketing page, they're dialing up the size to be on the larger side, the density to be more airy, the size contrast to be higher. And then once you get to the product, right, everything gets smaller, more compact, and lower size contrast between elements. 
So how can you define your levers? Um, similar to Katie's talk with animation, you can use your brand traits. So here's how I worked, um, worked on this when I was working with Vox Media. Um, my team was starting, uh, was working on a design system for the eight different brands that were part of Vox Media's network. And we were starting from design languages that had been developed for social and print, but we had to turn that into a system and make it work digitally. Uh, the challenge was that we had to represent all of these different brands under one portfolio, but they had very different brand traits and missions. So let's compare some of the key elements of Vox versus The Verge. So Vox.com's brand traits are all about doing the work, being explanatory, being smart, being audience first, and generous. And then by contrast, The Verge's brand traits are all about being illuminating, beautiful, rebellious, thoughtful, and entertaining. So we can use that and those brand traits to make decisions about the levers that we're going to pull. So for, for Vox, we're looking at kind of smaller elements because the audience is looking for that explanatory content. The Verge, their brand traits are about being illuminating and entertaining. So we could dial up the size you know, we can kind of deduce that Vox.com's audience wants to see everything in a more densely packed way. We can also make some decisions about things like overall vibrancy in color. So Vox was more muted with its color palette, while The Verge is more vibrant. But what's interesting here is the range between them was still pretty similar, because they're both editorial sites. People are coming there to read content. The kind of user flows that people are taking between Vox and The Verge are still fairly similar. If we compare that to Chorus, which was the content management system that was powering all of these sites, that had a different audience. That audience was editorial teams, writers, editors, publishers that were looking to create and publish content quickly. So, on the, their levers were much smaller and had much lesser, lesser contrast compared to even Vox.com. So it's important to understand what is your range of expression. Like, taking a look at all of your products, what range do you need to communicate? Starbucks has a really beautiful example of this. They recently launched um, this design language at creative.starbucks.com. And it's essentially the philosophy of their brand. Um, they have this really beautiful infographic that shows their brand elements across a spectrum, from functional to more expressive. What they said about this was that, first, the design prioritizes legibility and conveying information as clearly as possible, which is, that's their shared foundation. The other half is about expressivity, emotion, and all the other intangibles that Starbucks wants to spark in their consumer. So there's that, that room for variation or that flexibility. And then finally, depending on the context, the brand system allows designers to dial up either trait as needed. So there's that improvisation piece. Depending on what someone is creating, they can either dial up the functionality or they can dial up the expressivity. So they have this, this concept of having a functional to expressive scale. And all of their touch points kind of map to, to that different scale. In order to come up with that scale, if this is something that, if your team also has a bunch of different touch points, like marketing and product or digital and physical, you need to understand what context are your teams solving for. So for Starbucks, it was 
environments. So people experience Starbucks in a store or on the go when they're ordering on their phone. Platforms like iOS, Android, social, and web. And then different formats like digital and physical products. After you define those contexts, you need to define what should your brand feel like across all of these contexts. So what, what Starbucks did was they defined that by either scaling up the functional or expressive aspects of their brand, you could make better experience for a different context. So mobile order and pay is super functional. They really dial up the functional aspects of their brand. They use the more kind of um, iconic Starbucks green that everyone recognizes, and they don't include a lot of pa those patterns and textures. But on social media, they can be much more expressive and really dial up the patterns and, and less of the kind of green color. So their signage is much more functional, and their physical products are much more expressive. The reason that I think that this is important is because defining your range helps teams understand where they can be expressive. So remember in the beginning where I talked about that one scenario where designers would constantly be asking, can I change the font? Can I change the font? Can I design a new button style? Oftentimes, that question isn't actually about a designer wanting to change a font. It's about them wanting to be creative and wanting to understand how they can be creative using the system. So if we tell designers, you can't be as expressive when you're designing the mobile app, but you can be really expressive when we're creating things for social media, it helps them understand the guardrails. It helps them understand the, the kind of launch pads that they have to hit. And I think that we can't ignore designers' innate need to be creative. So we have to figure out how to help them understand where they can show, express that creativity. So at this point, we're describing what our experiences should feel like, but we haven't yet defined specifics, like the exact pixel size of our typography. So those are the dials. Those are the, the small choices that enable all of the things that we've set with the levers. Um, I can't get into every single one of the design choices, but I wanted to talk about how you can set type dials using the levers that you've, that you've defined. So when you're defining typography, there's kind of these two, or a typographic system, there's, the, there's these two big things that you want to define your base font size, and your font ratio. The base font size is the size of your body copy. And then the type hierarchy is the scale of all of your type elements in relation to each other. Um, I use modularscale.com to create my type systems, because in it, you can set a base font size and a font ratio and it'll generate type systems that you can work with. So if you've decided that you want a type system that has higher size contrast, what you can do is use a larger font ratio, like 1.5, and that'll give you a more dramatic size contrast between the heading sizes. But if you decided that you want small elements with a smaller size contrast, then you can go with a smaller ratio, like 1.067. And so if you compare these two next to each other, you can really see that one has a much more dramatic size contrast. Um, and this is something that, that IBM does with their design language. They have a productive type system, and they have an expressive type system. And it's that same idea. They've decided that. On the products, they're going to have a type system that uses less size contrast. And on marketing pages, they'll use a type system that has that more dramatic size contrast and range. So 
to close out the part about harmony, um, Finnish architect Eliel Saarinen said that always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city plan. So remember that components aren't used in isolation, but around and within each other. And think about how, how they all relate to each other and how using those levers can help come up with elements that feel like they have a harmonious brand voice. So flexibility. Making a brand feel unified, cohesive, and harmonious while also leaving room for experimentation is a really tough balancing act. It's one of the most challenging parts of a design system. Um, graphic designer and pentagram partner Paula Scher faced this challenge with the vis visual identity for the public theater in New York, um, as she explained in a talk at Beyond Telerand. So she worked on the identity for the public theater in 1994 and had created these really distinct posters with iconic wood type and um, this dynamic energy. The style became so popular that it kept getting replicated, so it wasn't recognizable to the public theater anymore. So Cher found that she constantly had to change the styles to keep it fresh. But what she said was she began to realize that if you made everything the same, it was boring after the first year. But if you changed it individually for each play, then the theater lost recognizability. What she ended up doing for the redesign is she designed basically a system for the posters. And so each year, um, some of the elements would skew. So text would skew in a different direction. Um, things might be sliced. Images might be treated a, a different way. But the result was that the posters for each season fit as their own system, but the identity for the public theater also wasn't lost. Uh, so even with the most robust or thoroughly planned systems, you're going to need to account for variation at some point. So variation in a system is just a divergence from the styles that have been established. And I've seen three different types of variation. Unintentional divergence is typically happens when a designer can't find what they're looking for. They might not know that something is in a system, so they just create a new style. Then you have intentional but unnecessary divergence. And that could be the scenario where I shared earlier, where a designer just adds a new font or does something different because they want to be creative. And then there's intentional, meaningful divergence which is what we want to get to with an expressive system. Intentional meaningful divergence is the divergence of solving a specific problem. So there's a couple of contexts for variation. Um, three of them that I found are brand, audience, and environment. So with brand, um, at Vox Media, like I said, we needed to create a design system that worked for eight distinct editorial brands with distinct editorial missions. Then there's audience. I think Airbnb, like their standard listing and their plus listing is a good example because they're basically designing for a different tier of service. And so the plus listing has more space, lighter typography. It feels more premium. And then at Shopify, we're designing for a range of environments. So from a retail store to a warehouse, a back office, or a conference. Um, and that often means that experiences are used in variable lighting conditions, like dim or bright lighting, and on different um, screen sizes. So our system needs to be flexible for those contexts. I found that striking the right balance between good variation and bad variation can be tough. But what I found is that variation is good if there's a specific problem that we need a new pattern to solve, if it's determined by user scenarios and content needs, and if it strengthens brand voice in a way that serves our audience. But bad variation tends to be visual variation on components that serve the same function across brands and don't do much to serve brand voice. So 
At Vox, we had these newsletter templates that were really, really different for no, for no really good reason. So we ended up unifying them into, into one design because this wasn't the right place to have variation. But in some cases, we ended up designing things, de designing components just for the purpose of variation. So these were some masthead components that we created specifically for The Verge so that they could basically theme their homepage throughout the day. And even though we, this started off as a variation for The Verge, the component was applicable enough to a bunch of different brands. So different brands on the content management system have ended up using this masthead component um, to communicate their brand voice. So the masthead is a really good example of adding flexibility into components. And Brad Frost has this blog post called um, Component Flexibility, which has the couple of ways that you can vary your components through content, structure, style, and behavior. So I think BBC's gel card component is a really good example where, um, depending on the content, it might look a certain way. The structure, with or without labels, it could look different. Google's material theming, I think, is a really good example of adding variation with style. And then the card also has this collapse and expand functionality. So design systems don't need to limit or stifle brand expression. And you have a vast variety of tools to choose from if you're deciding on the right kind of variation to have. So improvisation. I've asked a lot of people to tell me what a good design system feels like and what a bad design system feels like. What I've heard is that a bad design system feels like having to use a hammer when what you need is a screwdriver, but a good design system helps you improvise. Um, it's like cooking. If you've done all of the prep work ahead of time, chopped your vegetables, measured your spices, then you can start improvising as you assemble your ingredients. Now, we love a cooking metaphor at Shopify, and lately, we've been asking ourselves, what does it mean to create chefs versus cooks with the design system? UX manager Stephanie Posey wrote an article for this on the Shopify UX blog, where she said, a cook knows what to do to create an enjoyable dish. Then they use that knowledge and repeat what works to create a consistent experience. A chef not only knows what to do, but why it's done. We don't want designers to follow the design system like a recipe book. We want them to invent new dishes. So when people understand the rationale behind the system, they're more likely to use it creatively. So back to the hammer versus screwdriver analogy, I think the worst thing we can do with the design system is give people tools that don't solve the problem that they're looking for. I often hear that a design system is like the IKEA, like an, giving people an IKEA kit. But the problem with giving people an IKEA kit is if you give people the same pieces, they're all going to build the exact same chair. And that, that's not expressive. Instead, I think about it like if I gave my team the materials, like oak plants, nails, paint, along with some guidelines, then we might end up with a family of chairs that are different, but all feel cohesive. This is a great example from Hay Design. And I think what's so interesting is that basically in the description of the family of chairs, they described the shared foundation and the room for variation. So all the chairs in the series have a high bed rest and a generous seat, but you can have different finishes and different types of fabric so that it works in a corporate, public, or private environment. So design systems shouldn't be static. And the best way to evolve your design system is to test it in real products. Product teams are so knowledgeable about how the system should be used that we need to help them shape our system. Like Christopher Alexander said, 
Our patterns stay alive because the people who are using them are also testing them. So I'll give a very quick example of how this played out at Shopify. This is a banner component that's part of Polaris. It worked really well when it was at the top of a page and there was enough space around it. But when a team tried to embed it in a card, it was way too big. So the team came to the Polaris team asking if they could work on a solution together. And what ended up happening was the logistics team and the Polaris team worked together, tested the variation in their product, and then it made its way back into the system. So the last part is about encouraging contribution. We want to keep systems being expressive by kind of addressing uh, this scenario in the beginning. Shared ownership keeps systems alive. So what you need to do is help people understand why they should contribute, how they should contribute, and then also celebrate contributions. So a few ways that we do this, um, again, on Polaris, we kind of specify that we're looking for contributions. Gov.uk does a really good job of describing how you contribute to the system. And then the other thing that we do with Polaris is we'll, every time people make contributions, we'll put it in the newsletter, again, to celebrate and encourage that. Um, and just to close out, the last part of creating expressive systems is enabling sharing across teams. So you might have two teams, and team A is working on a type of feature component, and team B is working on a very similar type of component. It's the systems team's job to bring them together to create a better component overall. The Spotify team describes this process when they brought every team that had been working on a data table into a workshop to improve the component. And what they said was, we want to tap into a designer's inherent desire to evolve or completely rethink parts of the system. We want a paradigm shift where our designers no longer view themselves as users of the system, but instead see their role as a co-contributor or co-author. Which reminds me of something called the edge effect, which Danella Meadows talks about in Thinking in Systems. Essentially, the greatest complexities um, of systems arrive at their boundaries. So when a forest species extends beyond the edge of a forest into a field, and a field species extends into the forest, it leads to new species that are completely unique. So borders are the greatest sources of diversity and creativity. So enable creativity at the borders of your system. Pay attention to how people are adjusting things, tweaking styles. Maybe you notice that a bunch of teams have started adding a new type of type heading. Study those behaviors and use them to guide the evolution of your system. If you enable creativity at the boundaries, then you will, your systems will grow and stay expressive. Thank you. If you want to learn more about them, um, I have a book from A Book Apart coming out November 19th, which gets into a little more detail with this stuff. Hello, Jacenia. Hi. So many questions, so little time. <laughs> well, we'll try a few. Um, how can you measure and quantify the success or effectiveness of a design system to prove its value to business stakeholders? It's a big question. So I think what's interesting about design systems is a lot of people try to measure them in like a very like quantitative way. Um, but something that I've been thinking about is like how do we measure so much of a system is, is more qualitative, especially when we're talking about a system that helps people create creative ideas. So one of the things that um, we're going to do on the team is do a sentiment analysis, um, which is there's a couple of sentiments that we want to change with the way the system is perceived today, like how people feel about how it enables creativity. And if we can measure what that sentiment is today, then in a couple months we can measure like, what the sentiment is after we make changes. So that's a way to kind of talk about like, how people feel with the system. Another thing that I found effective is just calling attention to how inefficient current processes might be. So 
someone that is like thinking about the business doesn't know how long it might take a designer to just like create an idea without a system. So I've seen some teams kind of measure, here's how long it takes to create a design without a system, and then here's how long it takes to create a design with the system, and then kind of compare that time difference. Yeah, and then you can put a dollar or, or euro mm -hmm. on that one. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, any thoughts on atomic design system? The keyword atomic has come up in the, in the Slido. So I think the idea of components going from small to large, like I think that, that makes a lot of sense. You need components to be composable and modular in order for a system to work. I think whatever type of terminology makes the most sense for teams is what makes the most sense. I mean, we, we still debate gloss, like we have a glossary, and we'll still, we're still debating what we call components versus basics versus elements. I think whatever, it's like whatever language sticks with a team, that's what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, what can you say about how you and the team might critique a design suggestion or something that might go into the mm -hmm. system or not? Mm -hmm. What's the critique process? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a really important thing, like making it clear up front what criteria you're, you're judging, judging uh, components on. So some of the things that we look at are, is the component brought, can it be like, abstracted enough to be used by multiple teams? Is it accessible? Is the code quality like good? Is the design quality good? So, but I think what's important is making that clear to product teams because the the last thing that you want is for someone to kind of reject a contribution and, and you not understand the rationale why. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jacinia. Thank you. Some water.